for the feast of St. Martha, Mary and Lazarus, I shall read from the poem of the man-god, the first volume, which gives us information about St. Martha. Chapter 112. I see the market square in Jericho, its trees and shouting vendors. In a corner, there is Zacchaeus, the tax collector, intent on his legal and illegal extortions. He must deal also in jewellery, because I see him weighing and appraising jewels and valuables. I do not know whether they are given to him as payment of taxes, instead of money, or whether they are sold for other necessities. It is now the turn of a slender woman, who is completely clad in a huge rust-grey mantle. Also, her face is covered with yellowish closely woven byssus, which prevents her face from being seen. One can see only the slimness of her figure, which is visible notwithstanding the huge greyish cloak that envelops her. She must be young, at least according to the little that can be seen, that is, one hand which for a moment she takes out of her mantle to hand over a gold bracelet, and her feet shod in rather sophisticated sandals fitted with uppers and interlacing leather straps so that only her smooth juvenile toes and part of her slim white ankles are visible. She gives her bracelet without saying one word, takes the money without any objection and turns round to go away. I now notice that behind her there is the Iscariot who watches her carefully and when she is about to go away he says a word to her which I do not catch but she does not reply, as if she were dumb, and she hastens away in her mass of clothes. Judas asks Zacchaeus, who is she? I do not ask my customers their names, especially when they are as kind as she is. Young, isn't she? Apparently. Is she Judean? Who knows? Gold is yellow in all countries. Show me that bracelet. Do you want to buy it? No. Well, nothing doing. What do you think? That it will start talking in her place? I wanted to see if I could find out who she is. Are you so interested? Are you a necromancer who divines? Or a bloodhound that scents? Go away. Forget her. If she's like that, she's either honest and unhappy, or she is a leper. Therefore, Nothing doing. I'm not craving for a woman, replies Judas contemptuously. Maybe, but by the looks of your face, I can hardly believe it. Well, if you do not want anything else, please step aside. I have other people to attend to. Judas goes away angrily and asks a bread vendor and a fruit seller whether they know the woman who has just bought some bread and apples from them, and whether they know where she lives. They do not know. They reply, she's been coming here for some time, every two or three days, but we do not know where she lives. But how does she speak, insists Judas. The two laugh and reply, with their tongue. Judas abuses them and goes away and runs into the group of Jesus and his disciples who are coming to buy some bread and food for their daily meal. The surprise is reciprocal and not very enthusiastic. Jesus says only, you are here? And while Judas mumbles something, Peter breaks into a loud laugh and says, here, I am blind and a misbeliever. I cannot see the vineyards and I don't believe in the miracle. What are you saying? ask two or three disciples. I'm speaking the truth, says Peter. There are no vineyards here. And I cannot believe that Judas, in all this dust, can gather grapes simply because he's a disciple of the rabbi. Vintage finished a long time ago, replies Judas harshly. And Kerioth is many miles away, concludes Peter. You are attacking me at once. You are hostile to me. No, says Peter. 
I'm not such a fool as you think. That is enough, commands Jesus. He is severe. He addresses Judas. I was not expecting to see you here. I thought you would be in Jerusalem for the tabernacles. I'm going there tomorrow, says Judas. I've been waiting here for a friend of our family who, please, that is enough, says Jesus. Do you not believe me, master? I swear, I do not ask you anything, says Jesus. And please do not say anything. You are here, that is enough. Are you thinking of coming with us? Or have you still got business to attend to? Answer frankly. No, says Judas. I have finished. In any case, that fellow is not coming and I'm going to Jerusalem for the feast. And where are you going? To Jerusalem. Today? I will be at Bethany this evening. At Lazarus's house? Yes, at Lazarus's. Well, I will come too, says Judas. Yes, says Jesus. Come as far as Bethany. Then Andrew, with James of Zebedee and Thomas, will go to Gethsemane to make preparations and wait for us all. And you will go with them. Jesus stresses the last words in such a way that Judas does not react. And what about us? asks Peter. You will go with my cousins and Matthew, where I will send you and will come back in the evening. John, Simon, Bartholomew and Philip will stay with me. That is, they will go and announce in Bethany that the rabbi has come and will speak to the people at the ninth hour. They walk quickly across the barren countryside. There is an impending storm, not in the clear sky, but in their hearts. They are all conscious of it and they proceed silently. When they reach Bethany, and coming from Jericho, Lazarus's house is one of the first to be met, Jesus dismisses the group that is to go to Jerusalem, and then the other one which he sends towards Bethlehem, saying, Go, and do not worry. Halfway you will find Isaac, Elias, and the others. Tell them that I will be in Jerusalem for many days, and I expect them to bless them. In the meantime, Simon has knocked at the door and had it opened. The servants inform Lazarus, who comes at once. Judas Iscariot, who had gone a few yards ahead, comes back with the excuse of saying to Jesus, I have displeased you, Master. I realise it. Forgive me. And at the same time, through the open gate, he casts sidelong glances at the garden and at the house. Yes, it is all right. Go. Do not keep your companions waiting. And Judas must go. Peter whispers. He was hoping there might be a change in the instructions. Never, Peter. I know what I am doing. But bear with that man. I will try, but I cannot promise. Goodbye, Master. Come. Matthew and you two, quick. My peace be always with you, says Jesus. Jesus enters with the remaining four and after kissing Lazarus, he introduces John, Philip and Bartholomew and then dismisses them and remains alone with Lazarus. You'll notice at the beginning of the chapter, Judas is lusting after a woman who's completely covered from head to toe. And then he bumps into Jesus and the other disciples, the, the apostles, and they're surprised to see him. And that's because he promised that he was going away to Jerusalem. So he needed to go there. He couldn't go with them where they were, where they were going. But in fact, and this is Bethany, it's not far from Jerusalem. But Judas does not do what he says he's going to do. And they've caught him by surprise. And Peter makes sarcastic comments, as we heard. But they all are really downcast, despite the fact that Judas is now willing to rejoin them and go with them where they're going. 
because it's clear to everyone that he's been lying through his teeth. And it should be noted that we're on the first of five volumes, and it's in the fifth volume of the poem of the man God that the betrayal happens, the passion happens. So very early on, Judas is not behaving as an apostle should. He's in fact probably betraying Jesus and he's not making any effort to overcome what is clearly a problem he has from this reading we can see, but also other parts of the poem of the man God. He's lustful. And we also have the interesting character Zacchaeus, whom we know from, I think, St. Luke's Gospel, that Zacchaeus climbs a tree because he's very short to see Jesus. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to be dining in your house. And Zacchaeus converts and becomes a model disciple. But here, Zacchaeus is clearly, completely onto Judas. He knows what Judas is up to. He's a wise man of the world. 